She'd even had a bloom named after her. Hilda Murrell was a passionate campaigner, a rebel of the most genteel kind. She was great character, uh, full of integrity, sort of an indomitable British lady, not afraid to speak her mind. Um, but for all that, she had a most infectious sense of humour. Hilda Murrell's death was a most English affair, embroiling one of the prettiest towns of the land, its neighbouring countryside. But above all, her death was to become surrounded by deep mystery, a mystery in which a whole range of fantastic conspiracy theories have blossomed. But now somebody's come up with what she believes is the first proper explanation. Trina Guthrie was a close friend of Hilda Murrow. She now lives and works in Lincoln. In her spare time, she acts as a prison visitor. And during the course of that work, she came into contact with the prisoner who said he was sharing a wing with two people who'd been involved in a search operation against Hilda Murrow, a search that led to her death. We then uh, had four very intensive sessions running between November 91 and February 92. In the prison? In the prison, yes. During which um, he told me this most incredible story. Trina Guthrie is one of many people whose lives have been consumed by the murder of Hilda Murrell. She, like many others, have never been satisfied that the truth has come out. Now, through her prison informant, she thinks she knows what happened. It started out as a uh, um, a search for information. Uh, they uh, hadn't intended to, to hurt Hilda. Uh, they intended to carry out a very thorough search during the time she was out. And by uh, deep misfortune, she came home and interrupted them. This is the house where Hilda Murrell lived in Shrewsbury. On the late morning of Wednesday, March the 21st, 1984, she arrived back here after doing some shopping. Nobody, despite a massive police investigation, seems to know exactly what happened in the house on that fateful morning. But sometime after midday, she was driven erratically from her house in her own car. 60 witnesses saw the car as it was driven by an unknown man towards the center of Shrewsbury and even past the main police station. By 1.20 that same Wednesday afternoon, the car had been abandoned in a ditch along this lane in an area called Hunkingdon, a few miles outside Shrewsbury. It was reported to the police that afternoon and again the following day, but apparently no action was taken. It was a few hundred yards from where the car was abandoned across this field that the body of Hilda Murrell was to be found three days later. It was found in the middle of this copse after a search by police and local people. They found her with severe bruising to the face and stab wounds on her arm and abdomen. It later transpired that she had traces of semen on her clothing. The post-mortem report suggested, however, that she'd probably died of hypothermia. The murder of Hilda Murrell was to become one of the most enduringly mysterious cases in English criminal history. Despite a massive, though much criticized police operation, her killers have never been found. The police maintain to this day that her death was the result of a straightforward burglary that went wrong. But virtually all those who know her, all those who've taken up a case, think that very much more sinister reasons lie behind the murder of Hilda Murrell. According to the Trina Guthrie version of events, Hilda Murrell died as the result of a search operation that went horribly wrong. Her house was targeted by a team of four people working for a private security company commissioned by a government agency. The main pair, a man and a woman, were described as the intelligent part of the operation. The man was said to be obsessed with guns. The woman was of Nordic appearance and codenamed Helga. The third member of the team, according to this account, was one of two heavies, a highly disturbed individual with neo-Nazi leanings and a history of sex offences against children. The fourth member of the team, also a heavy, was one of Miss Guthrie's informant sources. He has since left prison and is now receiving psychiatric care in hospital for severe depression. 
Two other people, according to Trina Guthrie, were involved outside the house. The first was codenamed Demeter, allegedly the link man to a senior official figure in London. The other, she says, was the team leader, said to be still in prison serving a long sentence for armed robbery, for which he claims he was framed. He was the second source of Trina Guthrie's informant. Two of the team were well aware of the, um, of the nature of the operation and exactly what they were looking for. The other two, who were the heavies or the thugs, had no knowledge um, of the precise detail of the object of the search, but uh, knew that this was a, a big and important job related to government business. According to Trina Guthrie's informant, the object of the search that day were papers relating to the sinking of the Belgrano at the start of the Falklands War. The Argentinian ship was torpedoed in May 1982 with the loss of 368 lives. The action scuppered a Peruvian peace plan and was to lead to intense political pressure on the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. Why did you give the orders to sink it? But it was not sailing away from the Falklands. It was in an area which was a danger to our ships. The crucial connection between the Belgrano and Hilda Merrill is her nephew, Robert Green. At the time of the sinking, he was a senior naval intelligence officer and one of just a handful of people who knew intimately the details of the sinking. He left the Navy after the Falklands War to become an anti-nuclear campaigner with an alternative lifestyle. The suspicion was that he may have passed information on to his aunt, an action he's always denied the team entered the house and began a very thorough search. Uh, Hilda came home and interrupted them. She was um, caught, taken, uh, I believe, upstairs into the bedroom, tied up in a sheet. Trina Guthrie was told that the search of the house revealed nothing, so the two people in charge of the team went off to search Hilda's holiday cottage not far away. The two left upstairs with Hilda in a bedroom now apparently decided to try and get information out of her by torturing her with a towel and water. The one who's now in a psychiatric um, hospital, according to my informant, said he, he went downstairs to get either to get the water or the towel, um, leaving the neo-Nazi alone with Hilda. The neo-Nazi was then uh, was sexually aroused by uh, the business of, of having um, a helpless woman uh, in his power and that's when the obscene act of masturbation occurred. Not too long after that um, I gather the, uh, the other two returned and were horrified in fact at what had occurred because you can see the two more intelligent, the two more intelligent ones and um, they, uh, the, they became well aware then that the whole thing had just gone horribly wrong and pitched right downhill. This account was first revealed in a book just published by Gary Murray, a private investigator who says that private security firms like his are often used by the intelligence services to carry out deniable operations. Now the Murray norm is Guthrie will reveal the names of their informants except to a special inquiry. But Murray says he did visit the alleged member of the team now in a psychiatric hospital. After a long chat about things in general, he changed the subject. Well, I suddenly produced a photograph of Hilda Morrill, and his change of demeanour was unbelievable. Um, present at that interview was a senior psychiatric nurse who has um, gone on the record for me as saying that the man's reaction was positive. I put to him several names of people I believe to have been involved and again his demeanour completely deteriorated, he was shocked, he began pacing around the cell in a very distressed state. Um, this man, I believe, knows something, I believe he was one of the men. The trouble with Trina Guthrie's account, as she readily admits, is that it's only hearsay. Moreover, it's based partly on the word of someone who's now mentally ill, though he wasn't at the time that he was apparently confessing. But Channel 4 News has managed to corroborate some important parts of the story. That the witness does indeed exist. That he was interviewed by Gary Murray. And that during this, he behaved exactly in the way that Murray describes. After each meeting with her informant, Trina Guthrie typed up detailed notes of what he'd said. 
as Guthrie is a trained scientist and publications officer for the Royal Society of Nature Conservation. She accepts that her story is only hearsay, but says she firmly believes the account because of the nature of the information involved. Are you satisfied that you're not the victim of some kind of elaborate hoax? I, I believe it. I, uh, I have a, a, you know, enough skepticism to stand outside and, um, and look at it and um, say exactly what you're saying, that it, it, could, it could be a fantasy, but in my heart of hearts, and having thought about it long and deeply, I believe, I believe that substantially it is true. Why won't you give the police these names? I believe that um, this, this information, uh, the significance of this information is so, is so serious and I fear that um, its suppression for so long is sign of a cover-up at a very high level, that the only way of avoiding that is to try to get it pushed so far into the public domain that it cannot be covered up. Hilda Murrell was fervently anti-nuclear. She was one of thousands who attended a CND rally against cruise missiles in London. As part of this, she was also closely involved with an environmental pressure group called Eco Ropa. Less than a year after the sinking of the Belgrano, Eco Ropa produced a leaflet which stated that the Argentinian ship had been precisely 59 miles outside the exclusion zone when it was sunk. According to the Labour MP Tam Diel, who has followed the Murrell murder closely and who firmly believes the Belgrano theory, the information in the Ecoropa leaflet was explosive. On no previous occasion had the figure of 59 miles been given. And what effect do you think this leaflet might have had on the intelligence services? Oh, they could have jumped like scalded cats because I mean, the intelligence services, seeing that, might well have reacted. Where in heaven's name are they getting all this information? As information that only can come from the inside. But Hilda Murrell's nephew, Robert Green, totally rejects the Belgrano theory. He says his aunt was murdered because the nuclear industry suspected that she'd acquired information from a scientist about a serious design fault in the proposed Sizewell B power station in Suffolk, which she planned to produce at the major public inquiry, which was then taking place. Some people, some of them are clearly your friends, say that you have pushed the nuclear argument because, understandably, you can't face up to the fact that just the mere suspicion that you may have fed information about the Belgrano to your aunt resulted in her house being searched and subsequent events. Yes, I mean the first thing I, I do will... Do you accept that? Yes, I do accept that. I mean the first thing I would, I would like to say is that I did not do that. I cannot of course rule it out that they had gone really hard on that line uh, and I accept that. But I do have good information myself which balances this you see and so I am reassured by that. It's hard to see just where the reopened police investigation into the murder might get. For even if Trina Guthrie does supply the names of the sources, the men involved have little gain from revealing to the police what, if anything, they know of her death. It seems likely, therefore, that without further fresh information, Trina Guthrie's account will do little to change the police's long-held view that the murder of Hilda Murrell was the result of a simple burglary that went wrong. War begins tomorrow.